Aum Satchidatmanyanushyute Nitye Vishnau Prakalpita Vyaktayo Vividha Sarva Hatake Katakadivat Satchidatmani whose nature is existence, intelligence. Anushyute, which is all-pervading. Nitye, eternal. Vishnu, upon Vishnu, one whose stride is the greatest. Prakalpita, projected by imagination. Vyaktayaha, manifested. Vividha, manifold. Sarva, all, hatake, out of gold, katakadivat, just as different ornaments are all made out of the same gold. All the various forms exist in the imagination of the perceiver, the substratum being the eternal and all-pervading Vishnu, whose nature is existence and intelligence. Names and forms are like bangles and bracelets, and Vishnu is like the gold. Namaste. So, our verse today goes into a philosophical area that is very difficult to explain. <laughs> that all the various forms of objects and living beings in the universe are basically expansions of Vishnu. Now, when Advaitins talk about Vishnu, they mean something very different from when the Bhagavatas talk about Vishnu. The Bhagavatas are bhakti yogis, and the Advaitins are jnana yogis. <laughs> so they're operating from different levels or states of consciousness. You've all seen the good old chart, right? Four states of consciousness, four types of yoga based on them. So bhakti yoga is based on svapna consciousness. Svapna is dreams and thoughts, basically creative imagination. You know how when you go to sleep at night, you have all kinds of crazy dreams? <laughs> at least I do. I don't know about you. Anyway, <laughs> these dreams are expressions of thoughts and impressions in the mind that need further processing. Why is that? Because they bring up memories of past events that might be disturbing or at least confusing to the mind. So then you have to make up a dream about it and go into the issues deeper. This is a kind of self-adjustment mechanism of the mind. It keeps us from going crazy. And sleep experimenters have found that if a person is woke up during their dreaming sleep, REM sleep it's called, because there, there are REM stands for rapid eye movements. And this occurs during dreams when we are looking at all these different imaginary objects in the dream. And if a person is not allowed to dream, after a few days they go crazy. <laughs> They start hallucinating. It's, I mean, it's really wild. Why is that? Because of the undigested impressions. So, in other words, we need to dream. We need to adjust our daily experience and digest it so that the mind can retain its equilibrium. Otherwise, goes crazy. It just gets wild. So, then this brings up a good point. Then what is bhakti? What is personal religion? Where God is conceived of as a person, 
and one has a relationship with God or goddess? This is a form of psychological adjustment. Now, I know the bhaktis are going to go crazy when they hear this, <laughs> but I'm sorry. We are speaking from the level of jnana. And on that level, things look different. It's got to be. Just like if you're down in the valley or even in the foothills, things look very different from when you're up on top of the mountains, isn't it? It might be the same view, but a very different perspective. So in the same way, when one is in Svapna consciousness, where the contents of the mind are everything, then it's a different view, a much more close-up view, huh? Whereas when one is up on the top of the mountain, it's more of a perspective view. One sees the whole picture. So put these in context. It means that when we are in the bhakti level, what we are trying to do is create a relationship that adjusts our emotional mental, and moral deficiencies. And this is called compensation in psychology. Compensation means that we try to arrange things in such a way as to heal or at least balance our psychological instabilities. You know, ask any psychologist, that's what they'll tell you what compensation is. And this is why people do things, huh? In order to compensate for a feeling of inferiority, one tries to become a boss or commander, perhaps in the military or in the industry. In order to compensate for a feeling of loneliness, one invents an imaginary friend. This it happens in childhood all the time, and we think it's normal. But of course, it's not normal for grown-ups to have an imaginary friend. I don't know why not. <laughs> but anyway, so we have to invent a whole system of religion with, you know, a God that loves us, an all-powerful, all-knowing omnipresent being who loves us unconditionally and knows us, and even though they know us, they forgive us for all our sins and so on. <laughs> and then we can uh, feel um, a certain amount of liberation. To some degree, we feel liberated from the constraints and the deficiencies of our ordinary personality, isn't it? So this is religion, and this is necessary. You know, I'm not putting it down here, I'm just analyzing it. And if in the course of analyzing it, I have to kind of bust the bubble, <laughs> oh well, you know, we can always blow another one, right? So the bubble of bhakti is that I have this relationship with God in one of five flavors or rasas, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, or conjugal love. And this is necessary to adjust to a world where it's never perfect, it's never right, no matter what. Every time we try to make a relationship, it has certain flaws, has certain deficiencies. It's never exactly what we need. So just like we have to dream at night to digest and adjust the impressions that we receive during daily life, huh? we have to dream in the form of imagination in order to have a balanced emotional life because of the necessary imbalances in material existence. 
I'm sorry if I have offended anyone, but that is the view from the Adwaita platform. Now, the concept of an all-powerful personal god is known as Vishnu. Vishnu means all-pervading. I mean, literally, it means he who has the longest step. In the Puranas, when Vishnu incarnates as Vamana, he goes to Bali Maharaj, who was a big, powerful demon king. And he says, I beg from you just three steps of land. And because he's in this little form as a, like a, a midget, a dwarf, Everybody thinks, oh, just three steps of land is nothing, right? Bali knew, actually, that he was Vishnu and that he was going to cheat him. <laughs> but he said, okay, well, better to be cheated by Vishnu than anybody else. So he granted it. And then Bali put one step all the way down in Patalaloka. And then he took his second step all the way up to Satyaloka, Lord Brahma's planet. That spans a whole universe. And then he said, well, now where am I going to put my third step? And Bali bowed down and said, on my head. It's a very nice story. <laughs> a very devotional story. See, these devotional stories and things, they have value. We just have to understand, they don't have absolute value. So, Vamana, representing Vishnu, is one who has the longest step. He can span the entire universe in one or two steps. That means he's omnipresent. So, from the point of view of Advaita, this is Brahman, the self, manifesting as the universal planary consciousness. And that consciousness is distributed throughout the entire creation. And every living entity takes a part of it and designates it as my consciousness, my mind. In other words, there's the universal mind, and then every living entity kind of puts, a, puts up a fence <laughs> a wall around a certain part of it and says, this is mine. Well, of course, it isn't really. It's still part of the universe. But just like gold, gold is one. Huh? If you say gold, you mean gold in general, all the gold that exists wherever it is. But then if you take that gold and you make it into a necklace, or an earring, or another ornament like that, then you're saying, well, this is a gold bracelet. This is a gold earring. You know, and it's just like the clay and the pots, right? The clay is called clay when it's in the ground, but it's called a pot when it's in a certain form. In the same way, the gold, when it's in the ground, is called gold. And then when it's made into a necklace, we call it a necklace. If it's an earring, we call it an earring. But it's the same gold. In the same way, Vishnu is this universal consciousness, consciousness of Virat, consciousness of Hiranyagarbha, for those who were following our previous series and they know about these things. So this universal consciousness is called Vishnu because it's all-pervading. It doesn't have to be a person. In fact, according to Sankaracharya, on his commentary, on the Vedanta Sutra, chapter 2, part 2, Adhikarana 7, that Vishnu can't be a person because a person can't be divided up, can't be chopped up into little pieces. <laughs> Basically, to simplify his highly philosophical explanation. So he has to be like a force, like gravity or an entity like space. You can't really chop up space into little pieces. I mean, you can try. You can make a distinction between the space in the pot and the space outside the pot. 
but actually they're one. And the pot is simply an arbitrary form enclosing a little bit of space. So in the same way, the individual consciousness is simply the universal consciousness, but we create an artificial arbitrary boundary and that tries to limit it and say, well, this is my consciousness. <laughs> so when we realize this, <laughs> of course, then we begin to have access to the universal consciousness. And, well, that's going to be a topic of a later episode of this series. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Oh, no, my shit. Oh, yeah.